All right, thanks for joining in. Romans 13, are you ready? Let's get right into the Word of God. Romans 13, Paul is going to deal with Christian and their responsibility to, uh, to the government and to the governing authorities. And when we speak of government here, uh, don't think only of president and vice president or governor of a state, but think even in a broader context because the, uh, the, the, the main idea here is uh, of law and order. So we could include law enforcement uh, in, in this and we would not do any violation to the text because they are an extension of human government. And so God instituted government. I'm gonna give you a really quick preamble here. We know that God instituted the, uh, the family in Genesis 2, marriage and the family. In Acts chapter 2, God instituted um, the church, the body of Christ. But in Genesis 9, which is where God makes the covenant with Noah, and I encourage you to read that on your own time, where uh, Noah kind of becomes the new Adam, and God kind of renews some of the same things with, with Noah about uh, replenishing the earth and, and so on and so forth. But interesting thing, in Genesis 9, God institutes human government. Now, God had, had judged the world with the flood, and you can read about that in Genesis 6. But, uh, but then he gives man the responsibility to execute vengeance in the earth. Uh, and he says, or uh, justice, I should say. Uh, he says that by, if man sheds blood, then by man shall his blood be required. So God instituted capital punishment in Genesis chapter 9. And he never, um, he, he never uh, did away with that. And so if anyone wants to, to know how God feels about capital punishment, uh, in, in the instance of murder, in premeditated murder, he shows you very clearly in uh, Genesis 9 that, that Jehovah himself instituted capital punishment. There were crimes in the Old Testament that were capital crimes. Violating the Sabbath day was one of them. Um, adultery was a capital crime. And perhaps one of the reasons our society... Uh, is in the mess that it's in. Uh, I'm not a reductionist. I don't think there's any one thing uh, other than sin would be the singular thing, but um, our prisons are filled with repeat offenders and many of them murderers because we, we don't do what the Bible says to do in that instance. So that's kind of the, the thing at hand that we're talking about. Genesis 13, <laughs> Romans 13, verse 1. Paul says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, for the powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever therefore resists the power, notice that repetition of the word power or powers. The Greek word is exousia, exousia. It can also be translated as authority. Uh, these powers, whoever resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or punishment. We're not thinking in terms of eternal damnation here, but in terms of uh, retribution. If you commit a crime. So notice in verse 1, and we're going to have several Greek words we'll look at tonight. I'm going to cover this as quickly as I possibly can to try to keep the video uh, half an hour or so. First of all, we see there's no exemption. Every soul is to be subject. The Greek word is hupotasso for subject. Same word used when it says that wives are to be subject under their husbands, and just as the, ch the church is subject unto Christ. The companion passage to this will be in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 13, where, and it's the same context here, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance or regulation uh, of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So we see that God has given uh, human government for the express purpose of restraining evil in the world. So uh, we live in a world that pushes a very strong narrative now, and that is that law enforcement is bad, that there's systemic uh, problems there, and that what we need is more education for the police, we need to defund them, and we need to tr uh, train them to be more sensitive to criminals. When exactly the opposite is true, uh, what we need to do is punish crime more severely when when necessary, and it will be a deterrent to those who are habitual repeat offenders, and um, and it will dissuade them from doing so. 
so uh, this attitude of anarchy that, that seems to be so pervasive is, is the spirit of Antichrist. The word iniquity in the Greek means lawlessness. And uh, anytime you see lawlessness at work, you know that the devil is involved because he is the author of confusion. God is the God of order. And God gave human government uh, to restrain evil because human beings are sinful. Left to our own devices, we would kill one another. We see that in the very first family with Cain and Abel. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now that word ordained is tasso. The word for subject is hubitasso. The word for ordained is tasso. That word is also used where it says in Acts 13, for example, as many as are ordained to eternal life believed. So it has this idea of divine uh, appointment here. So regardless of who's in the White House or who's in the governor's mansion or who sits on the town council uh, or, or the various means of how they're elected, ultimately God is in control. And God uh, wants us to respect exousia, authority, because God has ordained authority in the world. Now, the question uh, then that comes in is, well, what do we do when, when we have unrighteous people who are making unrighteous decrees uh, in places of authority? Well, in that case, I believe there is a biblical precedent for civil disobedience. We would see in uh, uh, the Hebrew midwives and uh, they refused to abort the babies. Uh, they refused to follow Pharaoh's edict. And you think of the three Hebrew boys who refused to bow down to the image and were thrown at the fiery furnace. We think about Daniel uh, who refused to stop praying. Uh, we think in the New Testament of Peter uh, and the apostles standing before the Sanhedrin and they've been told, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. But they said, no, we have to obey God rather than man. Now, the Christian civil disobedience is to be peaceful. Uh, Jesus did not lead a guerrilla, a band of guerrillas to overthrow Caesar uh, and Rome. Uh, he transformed a group of men to be the salt and the light of the earth and to turn the world upside down through the preaching of the gospel and the transformation of lives. And so there's a, there's a stark contrast between a peaceful civil disobedience and and rebellion, outright uh, violent rebellion. Again, though, that doesn't mean that there's not a time for war, for example. And we think of World War II and, and Adolf Hitler, and, and you know the Bible says there is a time for war. But that's, that's uh, beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here tonight. But the one who, res who resists the exousia, the power, the ordinance of God, he's going to receive damnation. There's going to be punishment. There are consequences. And God made it so as a, rest, as a deterrent to evil. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And again, this is under ideal circumstances. We do know that there are uh, despotic dictators and tyrants uh, who, who have oppressive regimes, men like Saddam Hussein, who, who torture their own people. And their, uh, so this, this obviously is not a blanket statement. Uh, it also is not interpreted to mean that God sanctions the activities of every leader of every country or state or city or whatever. But this is a general maxim here, a principle, that under, under ideal circumstances, if you obey the law, you'll live a peaceful life. Mind your own business, obey the laws of the land, pay your taxes, do as you're told, uh, and as long as it doesn't violate God's word, and you will... Uh, have a good life, but he said a peaceful life. But he says in verse four, and by the way, by the way, keep in mind when Paul wrote this, Nero's the emperor, and he's guy who's ultimately going to kill Paul and Peter. So we're not talking about righteous. Uh, Paul doesn't say you need to submit yourself if it's a righteous authority, and I think that's where we have such a difficult time distinguishing. Okay, we 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 dis, we, uh, we fail to distinguish between the person and the office. Okay, the office is the, the authority, the exousia is ordained by God, not the person themselves as being, God is not uh, sanctioning the person. So therefore, and I heard Chuck Swindoll talk about this one time that he had a drill sergeant. He had a superior that was just not a nice guy at all. 
He was a jerk, but he had, he had to salute the guy, but he was not saluting the individual. He was saluting the stripe or the badge, whatever the case may be. He was saluting the office. And likewise, we have to learn to respect authority from the time we're little. And that's the problem with our world today is it starts in the home. And we have kids who have not been disciplined properly. Notice I said disciplined and not abused. But we have children who have not been disciplined, who then find their way to the school system, uh, who is not able to discipline them, and they don't respect their teachers, they don't respect their principals. Then they're in, they move on into society, and all the while they're being indoctrinated by, uh, by liberal um, individuals. Thank God for Christian teachers and professors. We need more of you. I know it's a hard job, but we need you. Um, and then they get out of school and then they become employees who are unteachable and who are undisciplined and who don't respect their employers, who become citizens who don't respect their country. They don't respect law enforcement and they don't respect uh, church leaders and they don't respect anybody. And that's the world that we live in, and the Bible predicted it would be so. We are seeing the mystery of iniquity being worked out in our generation, and it really stinks to see it happening. But as Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up for your redemption draws near. So we don't, we're not throwing in the towel, but, and we're certainly not withdrawing from society. We need to be involved in politics. Uh, I don't mean arguing, but I mean we need to be involved in politics. We need to get out and vote for biblical values. We need to vote for uh, for Christian people. We need people in uh, Christian people in schools and educating our young people. We need Christian people uh, coaching athletic teams. We need Christian people being mentors. We need uh, Christians on town councils. We need uh, Christians to be involved in society. We are to be uh, salt and light uh, of the world. We don't we don't become unequally yoked together with the world, but we are in it, but not of it. Otherwise, how do we ever influence anything for the good? <clears throat> Not sure where all I was going with that, but anyway, uh, authority is God-given. Verse four. Now I want you to notice in the next few verses how many times law enforcement is called a ministry of God. For he is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. There it is again. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers. There's that word again, minister of God. Attending continually upon this very thing, okay? So the law enforcement uh, official, whether it's the soldier or the uh, the police officer, is actually a minister of God. Now, the Greek word used here in verse four twice is the word diakonos. It's where we get our word deacon from. So, uh, so in a very real sense, uh, just as those who serve in the church are deacons, are, and there is a gift of diakonos, which is in Romans chapter 12. We studied that last time. Uh, the people who are carrying out public safety, the ones who are sworn to protect and serve, they also are God's ministers. And as such, they deserve respect by virtue of the office. And he says, they bear the sword, not in vain. In other words, the reason police officers are armed and soldiers are armed is because God has, has ordained them to be, so, be that way as a, a deterrent and as a restraint to evil, to protect you. Uh, these people who cry for defunding the police and get ri getting rid of law enforcement, you have no idea what the world would be like. You have no idea what your neighborhood would be like. Who are you going to call when you're in distress? Are you going to call the psychologist who tells you that you just need to have your you just need to affirm yourself? You just need to think positive. Is that who you're going to call? Come on, think it through. And then in verse five, he said. You need to be subject, because, not only for wrath, but, but for conscience sake. He says, now, uh, on the one level, the lowest common denominator here, uh, the reason people obey is because they don't want to go to jail or they don't want to be executed for a capital crime. That's a great deterrent. That, and I believe, and I've heard people say, in some places, parts of the world, Islam has become so popular is because... Uh, it is a system of justice. Now, it's a completely false doctrine 
The Allah of Islam is not the same God of the Bible. And don't let anybody try to fool you because um, it's totally different. They have a different view of Jesus. They have a different means of salvation. It's a false religion. Uh, people who are involved in Islam need to be saved. They need to come out of that. But one reason that it appeals is because it's a system of justice. So under Islamic law, if you commit, uh, if you if you steal, your hand is cut off. If a man rapes a woman, he's castrated. And um, and so, uh, you know, there's there's a deterrent to evil. So on a, on that one level, that's a deterrent to evil. But that's not the only reason, because fear will only motivate you so far. But also for conscience sake, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, um, you ought to have a conscience. Now, I don't believe that your conscience should be your ultimate guide because your conscience might be seared or it might be numb through sinning. Even Paul said that he didn't depend on his own conscience as a means of whether uh, he was justified or not. Verse six, it says that this is the reason we pay taxes. Now, we could argue whether or not we feel like we're our we're getting representation for our taxation, and I'm going to try not to wax political here, if God will help restrain me from doing so. But um, but the reason we pay taxes in a perfect world again, ideally, is that we can pay for the safety and the benefit and the welfare uh, or well-being, I should say, well-being of the society, members of society. And therefore, he says in verse seven, by the way, did I mention this already? The word for minister in verse six is different than diakonos. This word for um, for minister is, let me listen to it pronounced here. Liturgos. Liturgos. Thank you, my friend, on my Greek software. Liturgos. This, is, this kind of minister is a priestly minister. Uh, it's a different Greek word. And it means to minister uh, those who minister in the temple. So again, they're God's ministers, and they and it's hard business. Being a public servant is hard. Now, I know some of these politicians, they, they live lives of ease, it would seem, but I'm talking about those who actually protect and serve. Verse seven, render therefore to all whom their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, okay? Give respect where it's due by virtue of the office, not by virtue of whether you agree or not with his or her um, belief or politics. Verse eight, owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Okay, first of all, I don't believe that this is saying that if you have a mortgage or a car payment that you're living in sin. Context is key here. What is it that he's saying that we should not owe? He's saying don't withhold your taxes, don't withhold respect to those to whom it is due. Don't withhold compliance to those with whom it is due. When the officer tells you to pull over and, and obey, then do so. Don't say, well, I'm a Christian and Jesus is my king and you ain't gonna tell me what to do. No, the powers that be are ordained of God. Owe no man anything but to love one another. That's the one debt that we never get finished paying. And the Greek word for, um, for love here is not uh, uh, like Philadelphia or Storge, but it's it's based off the root of agape. It's agapeo or agabajo, which is the self-sacrificing kind of love. It's the kind of love that God demonstrated toward us and when he uh, when Jesus died on the cross. Notice it says to love another. There's several Greek words for another. It's interesting that here the Greek word is heteros. It means another of a different kind. Now, there's another Greek word that's alas, which means another of the same kind. But here he says to love, he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Heteros, he agapeo uh, heteros. He loves those who are not like him. Do you see that? That's important. So I can love somebody that I disagree with. And it doesn't mean that I hate them. See, we live in a society now, and if you've ever spent any time on social media, you know that if you disagree with anybody, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, you hate me. You hate me. You're disagreeing with me. No, you can love a sinner and hate their sin. The Bible tells us to do so. You can't love someone and disagree with them. And that's what he's saying here, is that we love 
another. And in so doing, we fulfill the law. We love those who are not like us. You mean I have to love people who don't believe in Jesus? Yeah, how do you think they're ever going to believe in Jesus if you don't love them? How, how dumb can we be? You mean I have to love people who are living in sin? Yep. You know why? Because you once were living in sin too. We, live, we love those even who are not like us. And in so doing, we fulfill the law. Now, verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. These are randomly quote, random quotes from the second table of the law of the Ten Commandments, which have to deal with our vertical relationships. The first four have to deal with our relationship to God. The heart is, excuse me, the vertical is with, between us and God. The second, the, the last six have to do with our horizontal relationships with, with human beings. And that's why he's quoting from the second table of the law here. And he says that if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So uh, remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, which is the great commandment of the law? And I'm sure they were wanting him to get into particulars of the Sabbath day because that was what they loved to, to argue about. Uh, that was their favorite law was the Sabbath day. And uh, it's, ironically enough, it's the one of the Ten Commandments that's not restated in the New Testament uh, in some shape, form, or fashion. So uh, it's just kind of comical to me. But anyway, they were, they were big on majoring on the minors. But, uh, but Jesus, he took all the 613 laws and he, he, compa he uh, compacted them or concentrated them into two commands, and that's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, if you, if you could follow those, then you've, you've done well. And, and we see that. We see that if I love my neighbor, I won't steal from him. If I love my neighbor, I won't covet what he's got. I won't want his wife or, or her husband. If I, if I love my neighbor, I won't kill my neighbor. If I love my neighbor, I won't steal from him. I won't bear false witness and, and tell lies on him. Verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If you love God and love people... And when it says love your neighbor as yourself, it doesn't mean God's not telling us to, to, uh, to love ourselves because we instinctively do that, right? So what Paul is saying here and what God's word is saying to us is love others the way we instinctively love ourselves. Just like Paul would tell the Ephesian believers uh, concerning marriage, he said, no man ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it. And so we're to love our wives as we love ourselves because we do love ourselves. We're hardwired to do so. All right, then we get to verse 11. And that knowing the time, we need more men and women like the sons of Issachar in the book of Chronicles. It says that they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need more people like that, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation other than when we believe. And so now we get to the, uh, the ephemeral nature of human government, Okay. Paul says we need to respect government. We need to respect law enforcement. We need to be active in government. We need to pay our taxes. We need to be good citizens. But we don't need to be overly concerned that somehow God has lost control of the world when we see bad things happening. Because we know, look at Daniel's, uh, the book of Daniel, for instance. You remember when the visions that Daniel had and Nebuchadnezzar's uh, about the different empires of the world, God has already predicted the world empires that are going to be in place. And most importantly, that last world empire, folks. As long as we live, uh, until Jesus comes, there will not be true uh, inequality. There will not be true justice. There, uh, uh, True equality. There will not be true justice. There will, we will not get rid of racism as, as, as much as I wish we could. And I, and I see all these, these commercials and stuff, and, and I notice even the, uh, the sporting events. You know, they've tried their best to, to preach these messages of social justice and end racism. And man, I wish we could. And, you know, I'll certainly do my part to love my neighbor as myself. But until Jesus comes back, you're not going to end racism. Because Jesus said nation is going to be against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Uh, even the men, men's own house, members of his own household. Brother is going to betray brother. Uh, people are going to be uh, ratting each other out to the government. 
during the tribulation period. It's, it's going to be an awful time. We will not know true peace and true uh, justice and equality until Jesus Christ comes. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, look, guys, and he wrote this 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ is coming again. Can I get an amen? Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Every day that you're alive, you're one day closer to the coming of the Lord. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. No doubt this is the armor of God. Paul talked about it in Ephesians and about 1 Thessalonians. And he's going to contrast and compare or contrast light with darkness. Jesus said men love darkness because their deeds are evil and they refuse to come to the light. That's why folks love darkness is because it's a covering for evil. We don't want people to see what we're doing. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in envying and strife, strife and envying. Notice there's six sins here. There's two pairs, excuse me, there's three pairs of sins here. The first are um, rioting and drunkenness. You know, I think most Christians would agree that, uh, that, that they ought not be uh, acting the fool. Christians shouldn't be acting the fool out in public and or in private either. But but these are public. These this implies public that we shouldn't we should be good citizens. We shouldn't be burning down buildings and looting stores and rioting and and uh, and being drunk and disorderly. Secondly, chambering and wantonness. The King James says you probably didn't use those. When was the last time you used chambering in a sentence? Probably not. Recently, and probably not wantonness either, unless you eat some wonton soup uh, from Campbell's. But both of those, uh, both of those words in the, in their Greek form, have to do. The word chambering in Greek actually means couch, and it has. It, it, there's a sexual uh, connotation here, Sex, lewd sexual behavior. Okay, so Christians aren't, aren't to be rioting. They're not to be drunk, publicly drunk. They're not to be uh, sexually immoral. But the last two sins, strife and envying, I, be, I believe the church is far too tolerant of these things. Uh, we would say they would be lesser sins than the, uh, the, the, the aforementioned sins. But notice those two are also considered works of darkness. So those folks who like to gossip and bring strife um, in, into families and homes and into churches, that, those are works of darkness, envies. I want to be like you. I want what you've got. I don't want you to have it. I want to have what you've got. Those are works of darkness. Verse 14, and we're closing here. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision uh, for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh to, uh, to fulfill the lust thereof. So again, the imagery is of putting on a garment, putting on a wedding garment. Putting on Jesus, and he's, he's not speaking in, uh, in, uh, in terms of putting on a facade or putting on an act, but, but literally putting on the virtues of Christ, being clothed with the armor of God, and living our life in such a way that we are uh, reflecting the glory of God. And think about this too. When Jesus Christ returns, it is the marriage of the Lamb, and that the bride of Christ is to be a, a chaste virgin. We're to be without wrinkle or spot or blemish or any such thing. We're to be holy. We're to be clothed in white. And so that is how Paul says, we want Jesus to find us, clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ and living uh, a lifestyle that's pleasing to him. Now, he says to make no provision for the flesh. Uh, the Greek word here is pronua. Let's hear that again. Pronia. You have to roll your R's in Greek just like you do in Spanish. But this word here, pronia, it means to plan beforehand. You see, and if we're really honest with one another, very few of us just fall into sin like we've tripped over a, a, a shoe in the living room. We like to say that, well, he fell into sin as if somehow he unwittingly uh, just, oh, oops. Most of the time, if we're honest, the reason we sin is because we've made provision for it. We have, we have provided the opportunity. We, we have the means, the motive, the opportunity, uh, and, and we've put ourselves in that position. So what Paul would say to you and I is, if you know you've got a weak spot, and everybody does, uh, the book of Hebrews says we're to lay aside the weight 
that baggage, but also the sin that so easily besets us. All of us have something that we, we struggle with, some Achilles heel, some besetting thing. And it doesn't have to be some huge thing, but, but all sin is sin. And so whatever your, whatever your particular struggle, Paul says, don't make provision for the flesh. Don't, don't put yourself in a situation to where you're going to fall uh, into that and succumb to it. Um, Rick Warren said this, and, and there's a lot that I don't agree with Rick Warren on. Okay, so I, this is not an endorsement of him as some kind of paragon of Christian teaching. But uh, one thing I, I, I do agree with, Rick Warren said, every time we sin, it's because we believe a lie. And most of the time, it's that same lie that Satan told in the garden. You shall not surely die. There won't be any consequences. You'll just be, uh, God's holding out on you. He knows that if you do this, um, that, that you'll, you'll have pleasure. You'll have pleasure. God just wants you to, uh, he's trying to, uh, to put a wet blanket on your, your good time. And so when we sin, we believe a lie. But Paul says, don't make provision. Okay? Hope you've enjoyed the study tonight and shed some light on it. Obey those who have the rule over you unless they tell you to do something God's told you not to do or unless they forbid you from doing something that God has commanded you to do. And in those cases, we peacefully and respectfully um, say, well, we got to obey God rather than man. Love one another, not just the ones who believe and think and look like we do, but love everybody. And in so doing, we fulfill the law. And keep in mind that no matter how bad things get, and listen, they may get far worse before they get any better. I hope not, but who knows? Uh, I, I hear some ominous things um, that, that could be on the horizon for our nation. But regardless of what happens, remember this, God is in control. And the good news is Jesus is coming again. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up for your redemption draws near. Until next time, God bless.